I'm Larry Ray, President and CEO of American Manganese, Inc., listed on the TSX Venture, ticker symbol AMY, A-M-Y, with proprietary patents in the U.S., China, and South Africa. Our focus is on recycling lithium-ion batteries for electric vehicles. China recently legislated the responsibility for recycling onto their electric vehicle manufacturers and importers. For more information, please visit AmericanManganeseInc.com or phone me, Larry Ray, at 778-574-4444. You're listening to HowStreet.com Radio, available online at TalkDigitalNetwork.com. Welcome to HowStreet.com Radio, the online source for market opinions. Here is Jim Goddard. My guest is Stuart Muir. He's the executive director of the Resource Work Society. Welcome back to the show, Stuart. Thanks, Jim. It's great to be here. The BC legislature, as we speak, the throne speech is being presented, but we already know what's in it. The liberals have done a 180. They're now going to raise social assistant rates for the first time in 10 years. They're going to ban contributions to elections from unions and big business. However, this government is not expected to last any longer than next Thursday when there will be a vote on their throne speech. Stuart, with this kind of instability right now on the B.C. political scene, how does that hurt people trying to do business in the natural resource sector? Well, we know that there's decisions either being made that aren't favorable or decisions that simply aren't being made that would otherwise be made if there was certainty. And we saw that recently in a report that we've talked about, the Scotiabank report, that says we are looking at uh, some risks to a lot of companies that have operations in BC, particularly in the energy and energy services field, that will feel the pinch if there's a review of of some of the natural gas operations, if Site C goes down for some reason, you know, we're going to see a very significant economic impact. And that really translates to one four-letter word, jobs, that we'll be losing. So uh, the the uncertainty, I think, is already causing this. I was in Calgary recently, and business people I was talking to out there are are telling me that uh, they aren't uh, proceeding with developments at this time. And... Let's hope they do come around and make those investments, but but right now they're in a holding pattern. When you throw that kind of a, a bucket of cold water on things, do you think these people who will be taking power in B.C. realize that their statements are already slowing down the economy, which was the best in Canada? Yeah, it, it uh, so far I, I think let's hope that's the present tense, that it is still and, and has the potential to continue but the the things that drive the economy are often not the things that people think drive the economy. And one thing I often think of in that regard is whenever you see a poll done on this issue, you know, asking people in B.C. what they think is the most important sector of the economy, almost invariably they'll say it's tourism. You know, the average person in Vancouver, outside of Vancouver, thinks that tourism is the number one driver of the economy. And tourism is really important, and we're very proud of it, as we should be. But uh, the honest truth is it, it's not the driver of the economy that a lot of people think it is. You know, the things that really drive things are, are they're not very glamorous. They don't occur under our noses. They occur in the vast land base outside of the lower mainland that people don't see every day. And sometimes in their whole lives they might never see because it's pretty unusual to wind up at a mining site or a natural gas extraction area. You know, most people don't get to see that. They might see forestry because they're driving by it on the highway or they see some of the sawmills that are located in our suburbs and, and uh, outlying communities. But for the most part, you don't, you don't see that every day. Whereas people see a cruise ship and they see this wonderful shiny thing, it is truly a marvel. It's great for the economy, but it's not the driver. So um, I think it's easy for politicians to, to be affected by that because they're thinking not so much their own observations, because politicians are usually pretty smart people, but they're also affected by the mood of, uh, of a, a great mass of voters who are affected by, you know, all sorts of factors in the, in the environment. And, and one of them is that there is a low level of economic literacy. You know, we've measured it. It's true. People just don't connect the dots and need help doing so. So how important are projects like the Site C Dam and the Trans Mountain Pipeline? Well, you know, when Angus Reid went out there recently, the institute that does polling, they were looking at what people thought was important. And actually, notwithstanding the fact that that often people uh, don't see the important industries, there does seem to be a gut awareness that th- 
things like a pipeline to get crude oil from the oil sands to markets in foreign places are needed. And the same with Site C. You know, there's there's a lot of talk that we don't need Site C because uh, you know there's a whole laundry list of reasons that you see uh, given. It's not going to be needed, or it's too expensive, or that kind of thing. Um, but if you look at what the actual voter believes, it's really interesting. So you take Kinder Morgan Pipeline. That's the one that's going to be twinned. It'll come through Greater Vancouver. It'll, it'll allow the oil sands product to get onto ships so it can get a higher price in foreign markets. That's the whole idea. So uh, Angus Reid went out and they, they said, um, based on what you've seen, read, and heard, what should happen with the Kinder Morgan project? They gave people three choices. Let's go ahead as planned. Let's study it some more. Let's cancel it. And the way it split was 39% of British Columbia residents said, let's just get it done. You know, actually only, only about 26% said cancel it. You know, that's a quarter of people versus almost 40%. So, you know, it's pretty clear. When it comes to Site C, it's actually almost identical, um, but more dramatic because 40% uh, of residents of BC said, let's get, go ahead now and finish Site C. But only 20% said cancel it. And, you know, there's, I think, one political party provincially that wants to cancel it, only one that I'm aware of, um, and, and, and one that has said, let's absolutely do it. So, um, you know, the, the broad mass of people wants to do that project too. So there's two major infrastructure projects. Each one is of a value of something like $8 billion, you know, so a total of 16, call it 15 to $20 billion range of of direct value to build these things, plus the fact that over many, many years they will positively affect the energy economy in our country. And they will also, in both cases, lead to a more responsible approach to climate management in Canada. Site C, because it will create clean, renewable energy in an abundant, affordable way. And the Kinder Morgan Pipeline is because it will continue to let us develop our oil sands responsibly, continue to invest in the technology that is lowering the carbon footprint of our oil sands. You know, I was out in Calgary recently, and it's just amazing what they're doing out there in dozens of different fields and areas to to improve the environmental performance of, of Canadian energy. It's quite a story. We'll have more with Stuart Muir right after the break. Gem International is a new diamond explorer in the richest diamond producing country in Africa. Located next to the fourth largest producing diamond mine in the world. International Spotlight is on an 1109 carat diamond recently discovered in Africa by a fellow Canadian junior with a proven operator and finance team. Gem International trades on the TSX Venture Exchange. Symbol GI. Visit us at gemdiamondmining.com. Lotus Ventures Inc. is a BC-based medical marijuana company poised to launch into the rapidly evolving cannabis sector. Lotus is in the final review stage of the Health Canada approvals to become a licensed producer, having arranged facility financing of up to $12 million, plus building permits for its prototype indoor production facility. Shares trade under the symbol J on the Canadian Securities Exchange. Visit our website at lotusventures.ca. Welcome back. We're speaking with Stuart Muir. Stuart, because of the lack of direction that we have in BC right now, uh, any estimate on how much economic activity might have been curtailed? Well, we see with particular companies that have, say, you know, uh, five ten percent of their total operations in BC. We're getting predictions from Scotia Bank that, you know, they could, in certain circumstances, see a you know considerable retreat from this market. You know, it's difficult to say, um, you know, if we do have a certain governing arrangement in Victoria and Site C, for example, has to be cancelled because of that, that's uh, that's about an $8 billion um, cessation of ac activity. There will be cleanup costs, there will be penalty costs, there will be all kinds of costs, plus we will still have to build all of that clean energy capacity in the future. And chances are it will be the same darn project that they have to do just, you know, 10 years from now at a much, much higher cost when we probably can't afford it. So, you know, postponing expenses like that will be impossible to calculate until, you know, everything comes to a rest. When it comes to Kinder Morgan, you know, in, in a 
certain uh, arrangement, and I don't want to, you know, get into the partisanship here, but it's just the facts of the economy, really. Um, if we have a government that wants to kill that pipeline, it will mean a loss of about $8 billion in, in spending in B.C. and Alberta, m much of it in B.C., and then all the people who, and there's about 700 businesses and all their employees in, in B.C. who rely on the oil sands, they will be affected too, because the oil sands won't be able to uh, fulfill their potential to get their product to the best, most valuable customers. So how do you calculate that? I think there's a lot of work that the economists will continue to have to do, put numbers on it, but you know, just two projects right there, that's maybe $20 billion that we could lose out on. And you know that's a big number. It's hard to think, what does that number mean? But it means thousands of jobs, really. Green leader... Andrew Weaver was in the peace country of B.C. up north and uh, made some shocking statements, at least according to you. What what did he say, and, and why would it be so shocking? Well, I think that, that the, the local residents I spoke to after the Green Party leader visited earlier in the week were were still trying to process the, the things they heard. You know, they, they were told that the LNG industry doesn't exist, that there's that there's no uh, potential for natural gas to be uh, a viable industry. In fact, it you know he seems to believe that everyone who thinks it it is 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 hallucinating. But you talk to people up there, the thousands of people who draw their living from the natural gas industry, who are part of these investments in the LNG industry that is that is real. You know, granted, it it hasn't come into full fruition as quickly as possible. But the fact is, there are so many people in Vancouver, in the Peace River district in, in Alberta who are involved in this, who, who are making their living in it because investors want to do it. Um, so they're just, they're puzzled. And, you know, sometimes people call me to see if I can help them get through it. But I'll, I'll tell you on this one, I'm, I'm pretty stumped. I, I don't know why one would, would uh, go up there and deny what any, any reasonable person can plainly see is the case. Um, so there's, you know, there's some kind of... Uh, mysterious alchemy there. We'll, we'll see whether it's a successful strategy for the Green Party. I don't know. But with the Site C, it's a similar thing. You know, there's a project um, like 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 anything that involves moving massive amounts of earth around. It's definitely got issues. You could, you could look at the court cases involving First Nations and you could have the debate as to whether, you know, that has been all it could be. Um, nevertheless, you see these various lawsuits being settled one by one uh, it's a it's a 30 year project. Uh, B BC Hydro people they've been tying up the land over that time, and I think one of the great exaggerations about this is that there's some great loss of farmland that is arable that's producing some agricultural product that we're now going to be uh, not getting as a result of of uh, this dam going ahead. But if you look at what's actually happening on the ground, there's almost none of that land that's been used for agriculture for a very, very long time, if ever. So, you know, there's some, some myths and realities around the project, and I think it was good. I'm, I'm really pleased that we did see a Green Party delegation go up there. That takes some uh, bravery to go up there to see people whose livelihoods depend on some really important decisions who really feel that they're doing more than their share to support BC and make it a prosperous place you know they're providing the the food they grow a lot of grain up there the the energy you know they have wind farms they have natural gas they have uh, mines up there they produce a lot of good you know they really feel that they're the ones who are the providers for the good life that we have at the in the southwest and no one appreciates it and you know what i've been up there a lot of times and i do have to agree with them do you think then it's myopic here also when i talk to people about site c they say, well, look, of course, you know, power consumption has gone down due to conservation. But on the other hand, as we switch to more electric vehicles and so on, and this dam is a 100-year project. It's not just for the next two to five years. Yeah, that's right. And, you know, you look at the alternatives. But I know there are some people who say, look, uh, yeah, we've got all this stuff that's our natural gift, it seems, in, in B.C. to have these these amazing uh, uh, prospects for hydroelectricity. But... We shouldn't be doing that. Let's let's get a solution that they're using in Spain or in Australia because you know it would be nicer to have solar panels. Or, or let's let's do what they're doing in Denmark because they love their wind turbines and that's what Canada should do. Well, 
you know, I, I'm not buying that because I think what we have in Canada, especially we have in BC, is is the the best set of domestic energy conditions to pursue our livelihoods, to protect the land, to be a, a supporter, a, a cheerleader for the indigenous peoples who are seeking their destiny in ways that they must be the ones to define. We can we can do all of these things, and we can do it because we have the best set of energy choices. And the idea that we have to, you know, adopt some, you know, import our solar panels from China and put those up, and that's the way to satisfy the solar lobbyists. I, I'm sorry, when we have the potential we've got in our in our rivers, we've got our very clean natural gas, we've got the the wind supplies that we have, we have a neighboring province with so much oil that we are, through technology and science and, and the work academics are doing, we are making it better and better. You know, we've got our people making cars around the world that every year get more and more efficient. So when you have people come along and say, drop everything and you and buy my solar panels, drop everything, buy my electric cars, I've got the solution. Um, there's something inside me, Jim, that is just a little skeptical about that when we've got so many good things already. Well, less than 1% of the world's vehicles are electric right now. That's true. And I was just reading a blog post from this uh, Leaf owner, one of those Nissan Leafs, uh, who in, who said, I'm going to surmount this challenge. I'm going to see if I can drive my Leaf from, I guess, Abbotsford or Vancouver to Merritt. Now, Merritt is only halfway, if that, to to the Okanagan or Kamloops. You know, th- those are the destinations more commonly. Not too many people are going just to Merritt. But nevertheless, the leaf owner said, I'm going to see if I can get to Merritt without having to stop for, for a fuel charge. And there was a great long blog post about the trials and tribulations of trying to do so. And, uh, you know, she had to stop at the old toll booth because there's a place I guess you could plug in your car or if you're enterprising, and you could what, trickle charge it from a, from a 110 volt. And, uh, it, recording this whole adventure, it was like some, something from a past century of someone ar- undertaking an arduous trip across the Rockies by, by mule train, it it was a strange uh, account when you think about the just the convenience that we've come to expect from our motor vehicles today. Um, you know, I, I do hope that we get to this this uh, end state of having these uh, zero or close to zero emission vehicles. But uh, to 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 think that we're there now would seem to be still a bit of a stretch. If the NDP and Greens cancel Site C and the pipeline, if they can. What are they going to do to replace that stimulus in the economy, and will it be at the cost of higher taxes? Um, I, I think the idea is that they will they will build uh, bridges and roads and transit, which um, to me, you know, it's a good idea that you need those things. You got to have them in the economy. Um, it's a it's a logical error though to think that those things are directly going to produce export revenues in the way that, say, the Trans Mountain Pipeline will do. And, you know, that comes to back to basic economic literacy. And and it's really not hard because anyone who has, you know, bills that they have to pay knows that you you need to have two things in life. You, you, need, to, you need to have an income and then you need to have the ability to acquire the things you need to live, you know, a place to live, food on the table. And then you need that job to pay for it. And, and when it comes to the economy, the things that are the job that bring in the income, that's, that's the things that produce exports or export revenue because we can send our products to another country that can, then gives us money and we use that money to buy the things we need. It's, it's really just as simple. And for some reason, a lot of people don't get it. So if, if we, if we don't build the things that let us, um, build our income, we're going to have a really tough time paying for the other things we want to have to make our lives easier or more enjoyable or, or just, you know, just better in different ways. Um, and that's the balance. So you got to find a way to balance that if you're in government. And it doesn't matter, you know, what your political stripes are. The laws of economics are pretty much like the laws of physics. You know, they apply to everybody. We'll have more with Stuart Muir right after this. Avon Resources Limited is a gold exploration company with significant projects in British Columbia, Saskatchewan, and the Yukon. Trading on the TSX Venture Exchange, symbol ABN, and the pink symbol ABN-AF. 
surrounded by world-class gold deposits and mines. Avon's 23,000 hectares Forest Kerr Gold Project is located in the heart of the Golden Triangle in northwestern BC. For more information, visit us at avonresources.com. Keep informed. Receive our weekly recap of thought-provoking articles, podcasts, and radio delivered to your inbox for free. Sign up for the HowStreet.com weekly recap on our homepage, HowStreet.com. Thanks for coming back. We're chatting with Stuart Muir. Stuart, you were off to Calgary last week. What did you do in Cowtown? Well, I went there with a friend of mine, the mayor of Fort St. John, Lori Ackerman. We wanted to make a bit of a, call it a diplomatic mission out to Alberta, because, you know, in, in B.C., you scratch many a British Columbian, and there's an Albertan underneath there. And I'm one of those, I was born down in southern Alberta many years ago, and uh, I've made my life, most of my life, uh, when I haven't been in, in foreign countries, working as a foreign correspondent and things, I, I've, I've been in Vancouver, been on the West Coast, been in Victoria, and this is home. But you know what, I go back, I see those grain fields, I see those mountains, and that's another home for me too. So um, I know Mayor Ackerman's the same way, and we went into Calgary because we wanted to say, look, uh, you're probably hearing a lot out of BC, you might be worried, what's going on out there? Here's two British Columbians, we're coming out to Calgary to say, look, we're we're working for Western Canada. There's a lot of us who believe that building the economy of BC by by letting things like Site C, LNG, the oil pipeline project, and other related things in that category, you know, helping them to move ahead is something that builds a better life for all of us, and we can do it while respecting the environment. And we want to say that to to Albertans. So we went on to a radio show out there that's got a pretty big audience. And what was the reaction to you telling them that BC isn't just a bunch of dope smoking, sushi sucking hippies? Now you put things in your inimitable way, but uh, that's that's what you'd hear from a lot of people in in Alberta. Jim, well put. Um, you know, we had call, callers into the radio station. We went on AM seven seventy with Danielle Smith, pretty well known uh, broadcaster out there, and it was a really strong show of support. She was so pleased when she found out what we were up to, and we left there after the interview feeling pretty good about the fact we had taken a viewpoint that I'm sure is shared by at least 40%, maybe much more of British Columbia, and, and able to represent that. Because I don't know if you've been hearing lately in Alberta, they've been forming up a viewpoint about BC and our attitude towards helping Alberta succeed. And so they heard your positive message. Do they think they can get through to what could be a government here that just doesn't believe you should build anything near anyone. Yes, well, the jury's going to be out on that as to what Alberta's point of view is. You know, we we try to give a message that you know, you, hopefully you're going to be able to work with with everybody, have a have a positive relationship. You know, stay focused on 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 the positives, and um, you know, keep in mind that most people in BC do support the values that people in Alberta support. Or we're, we're the west of Canada. You know, sometimes within Canada overall, you know, it's us in the west that feel we're, we're uh, a category that is left out of Ottawa's thinking. So that sometimes can unite us in a positive way. And, and then all of these relationships back and forth where people are they're working in Alberta but living in BC or the other way around. They've got family, friends in both places, you know. They've got businesses that are somehow involved in both places. You know, there's so many bonds there. Nothing any government does will ever break that. But right now, it's very stressed. Well, I think there's going to be strained feelings between B.C. and Alberta as soon as the Liberal government in B.C. is defeated in the legislature in a non-confidence vote because Rachel Notley, the leader of the Alberta NDP and the Premier, told her MLAs not to help the NDP campaign in B.C., during the election six weeks ago. How is that going to help relationships between B.C. and Alberta? Yeah, I think there will be probably a lot of diplomatic shuttling between Edmonton and Victoria if, if we get that governing situation in B.C., which is certainly possible. Um, yeah, it's a, it's a tough one. You know, I think it, we're going to see uh, in B.C. as not so much Site C. I think Site C is a little bit out of sight, out of mind, and it's the more likely one, I think, to, to to just you know go ahead in some form. Whereas 
there's going to be, it seems, a very deliberate action by by an alliance government in BC to try to stop that federal project. It's going to test the Prime Minister and his cabinet as to how they approach things in BC. Um, it's going to, you know, affect the the revenue uh, forecast for the energy industry for the federal government. People are going to be saying, well, if we can't have that pipeline in BC, can we have a pipeline anywhere in Canada? You know, so so uh, the the degree of damage that this promise will do to Confederation, to our our good friends next door, is certainly one that's going to cause distress for Premier Notley and, and her people. And, uh, you know, they are ones with a certain special relationship with this this alliance coming to Victoria. Um, they, they'll be the ones most motivated to to try to improve it. And we'll see how they do. Stuart, thank you so much for chatting with us. Thank you, Jim. My guest has been Stuart Muir, Executive Director of the Resource Works Society. His website, resourceworks.com. You're listening to HowStreet.com Radio. Find us on Twitter at Talk Digital Net. Our very popular YouTube channel is Talk Digital Network. Questions for the show or our guests can be sent to info at HowStreet.com. I'm Jim Goddard. Thanks for listening. Comments made on HowStreet.com Radio are an expression of opinion only and should not be construed in any matter whatsoever as recommendations to buy or sell any financial instrument at any time. Available online at TalkDigitalNetwork.com, HowStreet.com Radio is a production of HowStreet Media Incorporated.